Um, so I want to welcome you to this great Sunday morning. Um, things are starting. School is starting. Yay, yay, depending on who you are, whether you're a parent or a kid um, or a teacher. Um, but Awana is starting. There's so much going on here. And it's, it's exciting to see that everything is getting going again. And um, uh, we're really excited that we're, we're doing more with outreach. And Stitch in Time is actually going. We haven't had Stitch in Time meet for a couple of years now. Um, and they're going to be meeting um, beginning September 7th, which is um, during the day they're going to meet from 2 to 4. Um, in the past, we've provided, they've, they've provided hats for babies and they've helped the Women's Center provide blankets and hats and so forth. Um, they're going to work a little bit um, on hats for, and, and gloves and stuff for the kids in the school systems that the teachers provide, teachers and counselors provide when kids show up without their hat. Whether it's because they forgot it and they're going out and they're just like, here's a hat, keep it, or you know, they don't have a hat. So they're going to be doing a lot of things like that. If you can crochet, knit, any other kind of talent like that, it's not only a great time of fellowship, but maybe you want to learn how to do that too. And these ladies are so gracious. They would love to have that fellowship and teach you how to do that. If you want more information, you can talk to Elaine Howery about it. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to tell you is that outreach is getting busy again. We're going to have golf outing. We've been talking about this golf outing. I've got eight to 10 people saying, I got a foursome and I got one person, my sister registered. That's it. <laughs> so, because that's who she is. I'm going to do it. I'm going to register. I need you to register because I can't plan a golf outing with this golf center unless I have golfers. They're not going to take me at my word that I'm showing up with golfers. So on our e Bolton, I put the link there. On the website, it's there too. You just click on it. You can register yourself, your other golfers. You don't have to pay anything to get there. So just let me know you're planning to come because that's the way Tim Murphy's helped me plan this right now. It's going to be a really boring golf outing with me and my sister. That's it. So I need that. I, I need the numbers so I can plan things. And um, along the same night, lines, we're going to start these pasta nights. Randy's been working with all these students and teachers and coaches over at the school. And the plan is for us to do a pasta night for every Every sports team, that's boys and girls throughout the year. So this coming Friday night, we've got the girls' soccer team coming. 35 girls, all from Highland, coming over here. We're going to make pasta for them. Um, that's, I don't know if you understand, that's traditionally they eat carbs the night before a game. It's a slow-release energy. I don't know the science behind it. It's carbs. So, but we're going to make the pasta. Um, Sarah and I will be here Friday. We're going to be making the pasta. And then that night, we just need people to come hang out and talk to the girls, serve them water, see if they need more pasta. So, and that's going to start, like, that's the first one. We're going to do this through the whole year. So you're going to be hearing about these pasta nights. Just drop into one of them and rub elbows with some of these kids. Um, they love Randy. They think he's just like, they, he walks in and they just start cheering. So just follow Randy, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> And then I just want to do a little soft intro. We are doing women's Bible study. Um, September 19th, Monday. September 20th, Tuesday. The Monday is a Monday night. Tuesday is a Tuesday morning. It's a 10-week study. Um, starting this week, you'll see on the e-bulletin to sign up for it. Uh, Peg Trisnaddle is teaching the Monday night. Donna Barbaria is teaching the Tuesday morning. We're working on getting that together. So if you've been thinking, I want to do another study, ladies, um, this, is, this is coming. It's going to come in September, and we'll get the sign-ups going this week, and we'll have more information about it next week. So I'd like to open the service in prayer, and we can get started. Lord, we thank you so much for an awesome Sunday. The rain came, and it went, and we've just got the sun shining, and we just thank you so much, Lord, for this wonderful group of people that work so hard every week to get worship together and the sermon. We ask that you bless the message today, Lord, and um, that we just take it with us wherever we go, and we thank you so much that you love and care for Mission Bible Church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you. We ask that you be with us this morning. As we prepare to take our offering, Lord, we know that you're here with us. We love you. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory and all God's people said. This morning, in case you hadn't guessed, in case you hadn't looked at the, uh, the title for the sermon series or anything like that, we are continuing in our study through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we are nearing the end. It's still going to be like three months. No, just kidding. <laughs> but we are, we are nearing the end of our time in this study. And if you recall, right, the theme for all of this, the theme as we've been looking throughout these books is hope renewed, God's faithfulness meaning the hope of the Jewish people in this, in this narrative. It was being renewed. It was being restored by God's faithfulness and bringing them out of their bondage, bringing them out of their, their scattering throughout the Persian Empire and bringing them back into the land of promise. Not to make them a nation again, because that time was gone, but, but by making them a community with a newfound and, and deeply experienced understanding of their need for God precisely because they had lived for hundreds and hundreds of years, really in separation and isolation from him and from each other. And as we've seen over these past weeks, they really started to coalesce as a community. They really started to, to draw together as a community when Nehemiah got there with his leadership. He, he brought them security and stability, both as his official role as a governor empowered by the Persian Empire, but even more importantly on his focus and the spiritual things, the spiritual importance, spiritual reform. Nehemiah was focused on, on building a community, a community centered on knowing and serving God with everything that they were, with love and with devotion and obedience to God's law because of that. And so now, as we've seen, the wall around the city has been built. They're now once again secure as a people. And so these past few weeks, we focused on Nehemiah's work of now that the wall is ready, now that the city is ready, let's get the people in there. Let's, let's move them in there. Because remember, the city was pretty much empty until this time. Most of the people weren't living there. They were living out in the surrounding communities, the surrounding towns and cities, trying to build up their farms and their orchards and their vineyards and, and getting their, all of their commerce together and, and doing all the things of life that get in the way sometimes of serving God. But now that time has passed the city is prepared for them. And so Nehemiah has now been preparing them for entering into the city. But before they could do that, they first had to understand and form and establish the kind of community that God wanted them to be. And the only community that could truly last, that could truly be successful for them, is one that is focused on God, committed to knowing and trusting and serving and following him. Because, and because of this, we saw... And we've been seeing that the focus of the people of Israel is beginning to shift. It's beginning to shift towards focusing on God's word as their source of community, their source of understanding of who they were, to knowing and understanding it so they could live according to it. And we've seen their dedication in these past few weeks where they would stand there and listen to the law. They had a special day of celebration that we saw that they came together just to hear the law being read to them. And then they spent the entire Feast of Booths Celebrating and remembering, yes, but also listening daily to the law of Moses, the word of God being read to them. And then we saw last time, right after the Feast of Booths ended, the day after they came together for a time of confession and lament and mourning of their sins and the sins of their nation. And during that time, they still listened to God's word being read to them. They took to heart the truth that they had heard and learned from God. That obeying God's commands is the way to life. As we saw last time in Leviticus 18.5, keep my statutes and ordinances. A person will live if he does them. I am the Lord. And so this morning now, we're going to look at their response, what they did in light of this time of corporate lament and confession that they had previously. And their response is repentance. Repentance. Commitment to life change. Turning from the way that they were going and setting off in a new direction, and that is towards God. 
They want to establish, again, a community founded on God's law, his guidance, but not just a static or legalistic interpretation of it that they have from hundreds of years ago. They want to live by the will of God in their community, in their context, in the reality that they were living together in the moment. And so, as we're going to see, they decide to come together as a community and dedicate themselves to all of God's instructions and commands. And in addition, because of their situation in Judah at this time, they also want to ensure their holiness, their their sanctity as God's people. And so we're going to see them also creating and establishing different rules, covenant together by these rules as well as God's people. Because all of this, all of this is about the repentance. What we're going to see in their lives is our thought for the day, which is this. Recognition and confession of sin leads to repentance, which is life change directed by and towards God's will. Recognition and confession of sin leads to repentance, which is life change directed by and towards God's will. And so before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, again, we are so thankful to be in your presence, to come together as your church here in Highland, Indiana. God, we're thankful for the blessing that we've had corporately to worship you, to honor and glorify your great name, to spend this time reminding ourselves just who you are, how awesome you are, how how great and worthy of honor and glory and majesty you truly are. So God, we do that. We honor, we glorify you. We pray, God, even at this time, as we look to your word, that this would be a continuation of our worship, that this would be honoring to your great name, that we would come out of this time with a greater understanding, yes, of who you are, but as always, so that we can love and serve you even better. All these things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. So if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. And even though the title says that we're going to be in chapter 10, we're going to start a verse earlier. And I'm I'm sorry if I lied to you in that, but we're actually going to start in chapter 9, verse 38, because that's where this whole section begins. But I didn't want to write the title, you know, 938 to 1037 or whatever it is. So chapter 10, but we're starting in 938. So I'm sorry for that. And like we've seen before, a lot of our passage is a list of names of people. And we don't necessarily need to read these together. They're here this morning in order to understand what God is speaking in this passage. And so we're going to read 938, and then we're going to do an overview of these lists of names and look at what the list means and what the groupings mean and all of that. So let's start by reading Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 38, where it says this, In view of all of this, we are making a binding agreement in writing on a sealed document containing the names of our leaders, Levites, and priests. And so, in view of all of this, what does this mean? Well, this is referring to everything that we talked about last week, because this is really right after that. This is, this is right after chronologically. There's no indication that there's separation that days or weeks had passed. This is at the same time. So remember last time, they spent this, this half a day in corporate confession of their sins, corporate confession and lament of the sins of their ancestors. And interspersed during that, they also spent time in worship and also hearing God's word being read to them. Corporate prayer, praising God, teaching themselves about his nature and his character, reminding themselves of his ordinances and commands, acknowledging all the ways their ancestors failed him, all the ways that they had failed him as a people. And in light of all of this, now they're responding. And we see here, that they're responding together as a community, coming together to make a a binding agreement to the Lord. And this isn't the same term as covenant, but it's synonymous. It comes from the same root as faithfulness. And so the whole community, they're coming together to make this binding agreement written out and witnessed by everyone. And so what they're saying is that this, this agreement, this is intended to be the standard by which they all came together in a community and understood themselves as God's people in his land of promise in Judah. And it was meant to be the basis of their life together going forward. 
And that's why we see, again, in chapter 10, verses 10 through, or 1 through 27, we see the leadership of the nation, of Judah, that they all sign this agreement. The chapter begins with the words, those whose seals on the document were. These are the names of the leaders, the Levites, the priests who agreed with and were willing to enter into this agreement. And so by sealing it, by, by signing it, they were putting themselves on record, both for the community as well as for the Persian Empire. They are committed to doing what this agreement says. So again, we don't need to go through each name, but let's look at each group. So first, the first name on this list is Nehemiah. He's not a priest, but his name is first on the list for, the re- for a reason, and that's because he was a Persian official. He was the governor of Judah. And so his seal, it lends Persian legitimacy to this contract, this agreement. It's an, or it's an assurance that this agreement, it's not a, a declaration of independence from the empire, which was necessary, again, because remember, their corporate lament last time included a prayer of deliverance from slavery and from oppression. And so Nehemiah puts his name first and he's putting himself on record and he's basically saying, hey, this agreement is a good thing. It's something that is needed for our people to fulfill my mandate as the governor to restore community and the worship of Yahweh here. So Nehemiah's name is first. Then we have the priests. And this is the, a list of names of, of family heads of the serving priests. And that's why Ezra's name isn't here because he was the son of Sariah which is the third name on the list. And so in signing this, then the priests, the religious leaders of sacrifice and worship, they're committing themselves as well to this agreement. They're showing that it is God honoring. And then after that comes the Levites. And this list includes both family names and individual names. And these are the temple servants, right? As well as those who we saw last time were entrusted with, with interpreting and explaining the law to the people. And by signing the agreement, they are saying that it's not opposed to the law of Moses. It's within our our official duty in interpreting and understanding the law. And then the final group of people we have here are other leaders. And these are family names and personal names as well. And it, it includes many of the families who were included in all those censuses that we saw, as well as some who were named by Nehemiah as being in charge of specific sections of the wall while it was being, re, being rebuilt. They're tribal leaders. They're, they're the rulers of the cities and towns. They're people in positions of leadership in the community. And their signatures, again, lent official community authority to this agreement. So we have all these lists. We have all these names, these people that are all signing this document. What, what, what's the point of all of this? Well, these leaders, they're coming together to sign this document. And this shows us that in their understanding, really, there's no separation between the religious and the secular in this agreement. This agreement is both a a civil and religious matter because it impacted both of those spheres. And really, this was the mindset that they were supposed to have in all of their dealings and in, in all of areas of community and service to God. Because they understood that in God's mind, there's no distinction between religious and secular because God is king over it all. And so even in this, even though we aren't a theocracy here in the U.S. today, we can still learn from this. We're followers of Christ. And we also need to understand that as followers of Christ, there is no separation between the secular and the religious in our lives. We can't try to compartmentalize things. We can't try to make artificial distinctions between what we do in serving God and what we do when we're living out in the world. Because as Christians, we pledged our whole lives to Christ, to living as bondservants of the Father and Christ in his kingdom, which means that our whole selves, everything that we are, it all belongs to God. He's king over everything in our lives. He's king over everything in our church. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. 
We see in the Jewish people here this morning, through their study of God's word, they had come to realize this truth, which is why they're making this agreement together. Their focus is really on one thing, and that's following God in everything. Their vow is a promise to obey and to follow God's will in all circumstances of life. Everything, secular, religious, it doesn't matter. It's all to the glory of God. We see this in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 10. The rest of the people, the priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, and temple servants, along with their wives, sons, and daughters, everyone who is able to understand and who has separated themselves from the surrounding peoples to obey the law of God, join with their noble brothers and commit themselves with a sworn oath to follow the law of God given through God's servant Moses and to obey carefully all the commands, ordinances, and statutes of the Lord, our Lord. So these two verses, this beginning part of this agreement, it it clearly defines what this agreement is. And first of all, we see that it's considered a sworn oath, as we see in the CSB here. And a more literal translation of this would be something like they are choosing to enter into a curse and an oath. In other words, the, the people of Judah are swearing here to follow the law of God with a binding oath and covenant. In their, in their context, in their understanding, a binding oath was a covenant agreement between two parties, a more powerful one and one who agrees to come under their authority. And the greater party, the more powerful one in turn, he promises blessings for obedience. If you enter into this covenant, this agreement with me, and you follow the terms of this covenant, I will bless you. I will give you these things. But on the flip side, a covenant also promised curses, negative consequences for violating the agreement. If we enter into this agreement and you don't do these things, then I will respond in this way and you won't like it. Right, the first covenant that God made with Israel included these blessings and these curses. Deuteronomy chapters 27 through 29 detail both the promised blessings for faithful obedience as well as the promised curses for violating the oath. In a summary statement of the blessings and the curses, it can actually be found in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 through 20. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God, obey him and remain faithful to him. For he is your life and he will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the summary of this oath that they're taking now, it's found in verse 29. They're committing again to following God and his law in all circumstances including specifically his commands, his ordinances, and his statutes. In other words, they're saying there's no aspect of God's revealed will, his written word, that we're not including. They're completely sold out and dedicated to following God in all areas of life. So much so that they don't want any aspect of their communal life to be excluded from this vow. This isn't, it's not legalism. It's a display of their heart's desire to honor God with everything all of their lives, the entirety of who they were, both individually and as a community. And this is so very important for us to understand. What they're teaching, what they're reminding us here is that relationship with God, in relationship with him, love and obedience are linked. They can't be separated You can't say that you love God without having the desire to submit, to follow, and to obey him with your life. Jesus taught this in his ministry as well, saying repeatedly that if you love him, you will show your love through keeping his commands. And I know, I understand that for many of us, especially in our world, in our culture, this this just sounds wrong. it kind of hurts a little bit. It sounds bad. I mean, I'm supposed to love God and I show my love through how I obey him. What's that all about? What about what I want? 
What about my life and my dreams and my desires? Am I supposed to just give it all up so I can obey, obey, obey? And the only way that I can be assured that I'm gonna get to heaven, that God's gonna love me is if I do everything right. I hope that's not the case. But it indicates in a heart, maybe a lack of desire to follow and obey God. Maybe it's a problem with authority, I don't know. And I think that most of the time, our lack of desire to follow God comes from a lack of understanding of the purposes of his commands. Scripture tells us again and again, God's commands, his desire, his will, his statutes, his ordinances, they're not a burden. They're not meant to be a burden. Scripture tells us time and time again that following God is the way to abundant life, joy, I mean, didn't we just see the people here commit to following God's instructions and do so then by having a week-long party to celebrate God and his love and his provision? I think the key to understanding love and obedience and how they're linked together is this. God's commands are not a burden. They are a sign of his love for us. 1 John 5, 3 and 4. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. And his commands are not a burden, or burden because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. So how can we flip the switch? How can we look at obedience as liberating instead of burdensome, as joyful instead of oppressive? Well, I was thinking about this and I was reading through scripture and I think that the first step for us to be able to do this is to identify which areas in our lives, which areas of obedience, which specific commands or requirements, which one of those do we find burdensome in the first place? Because usually it's not all of them. Usually, you know, we're fine with like 99% of them. It's just that one thing. Or unless it's just all of them and that just indicates a problem with authority in general. But the first thing that we need to do is sit down and think about and identify which specific commands of God just seem to kind of get under your skin. They're the ones that you don't want to obey and follow. And then after you do that, look for the reasons why God either forbids or commands that specific thing. Why am I not supposed to do X? Why am I commanded to do this? And looking through scripture, And studying scripture, in almost all cases, it's either self-evidently harmful or God gives us a specific explanation as to why he wants us to either do it or not do it. For example, why does God forbid lying? Why does God hate lying? Is it just because, you know, we're not supposed to trick other people? Well, when you look to scripture... It tells us that God hates lying so much, he commands against lying because lying is actually an act of hatred and destruction and that those who lie are serving not God, but actually serving his enemy, Satan. Proverbs 26, 28. A lying tongue hates those it crushes and a flattering mouth causes ruin. And then John 8, 44. You are, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. When we understand this, we begin to understand that God always wants what's best for us. He wants our good. He wants our flourishing. He wants us to be joyous, which is why he commands some things and forbids others. When we look at God's commands as just burdens that we have to endure, as ways of destroying our fun, then we're never going to truly want to obey them and follow them. Instead, when you see these things, when you see these commands, when they feel like a burden, Ask yourself this instead. If I disobey this, 
what joy am I going to miss out of? Because I want to follow my own desires instead of God's perfect ones. And even if you don't understand, and even if you can't see the forest from the trees in that particular moment, you can always have faith in the truth that again, God only desires and commands and requires what's good for us. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. And may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So what we're seeing here is that the Jewish people, they were beginning to learn these truths, again, through regularly interacting with God's word, regularly hearing from it together corporately, having it being, being explained to them having, them, having them show how it applies in their lives. And in light of all of this, they decided that it would be good for their community to enter into an agreement together to follow God's will, his commands, in all circumstances. And if you notice back in verse 28, this was everyone in the community. It's not just a promise of the leadership saying, hey, we're going to do this and we're going to drag the people along kicking and screaming whether they want to or not. All of them, the whole community, wanted to do this. There was no compulsion here. They weren't forced. This was a free will response to the goodness that they experienced from God and the realization of their own sinfulness in response as well as the sins that they saw in their ancestors as they continued to read through God's word. This is repentance. They are committing together to turn away, to forsake their former lives in order to follow God together. As a community, through this pledge, even to the point of holding each other accountable, everyone who is able to understand, men, women, children, no specific age limit here. Everyone who could understand and agree with the law, who could understand the stakes of this covenant, they were all included in making this agreement together. And the only ones who were excluded were those who had not separated themselves from the surrounding people. And why is that so important? Well, if you've been paying attention as we've read through Ezra and Nehemiah, you've seen the importance this is about building a community based on shared values and goals. They wanted to be God's people, God's community, which meant that they had to establish and maintain beliefs and practices in line with that. And one of the great defeaters of faithful Judaism throughout history had been in allowing outside pagan influence into their community. Influences which had would always lead them away from God, away from obedience, away from faithful love and service. I mean, hadn't, again, they'd just gotten done that very day confessing all of the ways that their ancestors had failed. And most of those failures were the result of pagan influence, outside influence. Hadn't they just experienced the dangers of divided loyalties in their own community with their own leaders bound by vows, bound even by marriage to enemies of the Jewish people? They understood the dangers of allowing outside influence to creep in, both from personal experience and from the experience of history. And they were committed to forming a community dedicated to God, which meant they were showing that through dedication to his instructions and his commands. And this commitment was shown also through separating themselves from anyone, anything that might potentially lead and pull their hearts in another direction. And again, we have to ask ourselves questions at this point. My question here is this, do we understand just how dangerous it is to allow worldly ideas and philosophies and values to influence our hearts, to give them entry, to give them access. How separate are we 
from the outside world, from the systems that stand in opposition to God, systems designed and put in place by enemies of the God that we love and serve. But one litmus test that we can use to determine that is to examine our hearts, our responses, what we feel when confronted by the beliefs and practices that we find in the world. If we ever find ourselves agreeing with, maybe starting to approve of the beliefs, the ethics, the actions that we see in others that are in contradiction to the clear teachings of Scripture, maybe just even feeling a little bit sympathetic towards them, then we know that our separation isn't where it should be. Remember, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And the Apostle John tells us why this is the case, why we need to be in the world but not of the world, and that is because of love. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. I think we all understand that keeping ourselves free from the influence of the world is not a small or easy task. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, that we shouldn't do it, that we shouldn't do everything that we can to limit to the access, the beliefs and values in the world that are in contradiction to God, serving him with everything that we are. It's what the Jewish people here in our passage are vowing to do together as a community, as as a people. First, as we've already seen, through vowing to keep the law in its entirety. And then second, as we see through the end of this chapter, through taking specific actions, promising to do certain things and not do other things. While not necessarily all of them being required by the law are inspired by the principles of the word as applied to the lives that they were living in their community. We see this in verses 30 through 39. We will not give our daughters in marriage to the surrounding peoples and will not take their daughters as wives for our sons. When the surrounding peoples bring merchandise or any kind of grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or holy day. We will also leave the land uncultivated in the seventh year and will cancel every debt. We will impose the following commands on ourselves to give an eighth of an ounce of silver yearly for the service of the house of God, our God, the bread displayed before the Lord, the daily grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbath and new moon offerings, the appointed festivals, the holy things, the sin offerings to atone for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We've cast lots among the priests, Levites, and people for the donation of wood by our ancestral families at the appointed times each year. They are to bring to the wood the wood to our God's house to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as is written in the law. We, we will bring the first fruits of our land of every fruit tree the Lord's, into the Lord's house year by year. We will also bring the firstborn of our sons and our livestock as prescribed by the law and will bring the firstborn of our herds and flocks to the house of our God, to the priests who serve in God's house. We will bring a loaf from our first batch of dough to the priests, the storerooms in the house of our God, We also bring the first fruits of our grain offerings, of every fruit tree, and of the new wine and fresh oil. A tenth of our land's produce belongs to the Levites, for the Levites are to collect the one-tenth offering in all our agricultural towns. A priest from Aaron's descendants is to accompany the Levites when they collect the tenth, and the of this offering to the storerooms of the treasury in the house of our God. For the Israelites and the Levites are to bring the contributions of grain, new wine, and fresh oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are kept and where the priests who minister are, along with the gatekeepers and singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. A lot of words, a lot of specific commands, specific actions they were going to do. All of this, they are covenanting together as their community in their context to both do 
and not do certain things in light of their overarching commitment to honor and follow and obey God with everything that they are. They're not trying to replace the law. They're not trying to add to it. They're simply recognizing that where they're at in their context with what's going on around them, with what's going on in their community at that time, that some extra steps and safeguards are necessary to ensure that they honor God in their lives. They're trying to do what they can to stay on mission. And so I was trying to think of an example that might illustrate this. And the only one that actually came to mind was, again, I have an army story for you, or actually a military story in general. For those of you who have not served in the military, did you know that when you take your oath of service, that you're agreeing to serve under what's called the Uniform Code of Military Justice? And see, the UCMJ, it outlines specific acts that are either required or forbidden from people who are serving in the military. For example, while you are serving in the military, your freedom of speech, it's not what it is on the outside. It's limited in many ways. For example, you're not allowed to publicly insult or disparage your leaders, including the president of the United States. And so the, the UCMJ, right, it doesn't replace the laws of the nation or the state that you're living in or the city you're living in or even the laws of other countries that you might be li living in. Instead, they are added on. They are additional. The regulations to govern your life and your service and help to ensure that everyone who is serving in the military together stays on mission no matter where they're at and no matter what other laws might apply or not apply. And that's what the Jewish people are doing here. They're agreeing to some additional things, additional regulations, specific applications of the law in their context in order to stay on mission in their community. They're saying, we will do these things and not do these things so that we can serve God better here and now. And so these vows, they're centered on their holiness, their sanctity as a community. And they fall into two broad categories, which we're going to look at very briefly. First, holiness in daily life, and then holiness in worship. And so first, holiness in daily life. Verses 30 and 31 impose requirements and commands and restrictions so that their lives, their community, would be set apart and holy as God requires. Based on the broad principles of Scripture, but again, contextualized to their circumstance. So first, no intermarriage. This is based on God's command that the Jewish people were not to marry into the surrounding Canaanite groups in the promised land. But in Exodus 34, 15, and 16, God forbids this. And he does so because of the danger of being led into apostasy. He specifically warns against that. And so the people here, they're expanding this prohibition to all of the surrounding peoples because of the same danger. They didn't want to be led astray, and so they removed the possibility by forbidding intermarriage with any of the surrounding people altogether. And then the rest of it talks about keeping the Sabbath. They vowed not to buy from foreign traders on the Sabbath, to have a Sabbath year of rest for their field, and to cancel all debts with other Jewish people on the Sabbath. And again, it's all based on principles found in the law of Moses in their circumstances. The temptation to ignore the Sabbath for them would have been greatly increased because again, they're no longer an independent nation. They're surrounded literally on all sides by all of these Gentile peoples who are going to want to come in and to commerce and to trade with them and to do all of these things and interact with them. And they are covenanting right now, even when they come in, even when we have all these outside influences trying to drag us astray, we are still going to keep the Sabbath because we are God's people. And in all of this, again, their concern was with holiness. They wanted to ensure that they were set apart from the world as God demanded, that their holiness was maintained both in the religious and the secular spheres, the sanctity of their community. It depended on their beliefs and their practices. They knew that allowing the surrounding culture to influence their beliefs or their practices would lead to compromise and eventually apostasy. 
So again, in our context, in our community, this is a danger that we still face today. And so we ask ourselves, we have to, is the sanctity of our beliefs, our practices, is it being protected? Are we being negatively influenced by the culture surrounding us? What do we need to do to ensure that we aren't? Because remember, everything that we do, everything that we are, everything that we say, who we hang out with, who we marry, how we serve God, how we seek justice in this world, all of this is supposed to be about glorifying God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. There's no separation between the sacred and the secular because in the end, it's all God's anyway. Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord, for he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. So, in their community life, holiness, we are committed to God. And then the final part of this agreement, verses 32 through 39, has to do with the sanctity of their worship. They wanted to make sure, as the agreement ends, that they do not ever neglect the house of their God. And so they agreed to impose these commands upon themselves. Not, again, specifically required by the law. These are agreed to in light of their circumstances. This is what the law says. This is where we're at. So this is what we're going to do in light of that. Because again, they're a small group of God followers who are part of a Persian empire, literally surrounded by people who hated them and hated their God. And so these commands are not imposed by God but they willingly agree so they can be faithful to him in their community. So what are they agreeing to here? First, a temple tax. This is a tax in addition to all of the other offerings and requirements in the, in the law. It's intended to offset the costs of, of regular worship and sacrifice for all the work of the house of God, as it says. Second, keeping the fires lit. They agree to cast, or they cast lots for the donation of wood for the altar, to bring it at certain times because the fires needed to be lit and maintained. So an ample supply of wood was necessary. So they're saying, this is what we're gonna do because of that. And then finally, first fruits and tithes. They committed themselves to giving the first fruits of their produce as well as a tithe of a tenth on their total produce to the temple and to the Levites. And this is more of a, just like an, an organization. This is what the law says. This is what scripture says. We're supposed to give a tenth. So this is the way that we're going to do it here and now. For the tithe, for example, here they're saying that they're going to oversee it by a priest of Aaronic descent and that it all went to the Levites for the support of their ministry. And then the Levites in turn are agreeing to take a tenth of what they receive and take it to the temple to support the ministering priests and temple servants there. So, what do we learn from this? Well, notice how mundane some of these things are. I mean, they are entering into a binding covenant, a vow to cut, collect, and deliver firewood. Hardly what comes to mind when we typically think of worship and service to God. But we have to remember what this is showing us is that worship, ministry, outreach, supporting missionaries, all of this, when it comes down to it, it, it costs money. Even keeping the lights on and making payroll. Worship requires giving. It's not always glamorous, but that doesn't mean that it's not important. It is vitally necessary Today, in our context, for our church to function as a church, just as it was for them to function as priests and Levites and temple servants, worshiping God includes giving out of God's provision to help support the ministry of his kingdom. Supporting missionaries, yes. Taking the gospel into our community and throughout the world, yes. But also serving and supporting those who serve in ministry vocationally as well as making sure that we have light and heat and air conditioning when we gather together on Sunday mornings. Worship requires giving. And it's not always about the glamour. It's about serving God. And that's where we're going to end for this morning. Next week, 
We're finally in chapter 11 going to see the resettling of Jerusalem, which, was go- which is going to be based on this agreement that they're entering into today. But for this morning, let's, let's end with this. Back where we started, repentance. Repentance is the result of recognition and confession of sin. It leads to life change directed towards and by God's will. And it will often, when it is sincere, include what we've seen today, setting up safeguards to help keep you from falling into sin in the future. Repentance is more than just an attitude. It's just more than wishing. It's an attitude put into action. The attitude of the heart is displayed by the actions of your life. And scripture teaches us that we are to demonstrate our repentance through our actions. Acts 26, 20, instead I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. Right? Repentance is a gift from God. It means so much. It means we don't have to wallow in guilt and shame. It means we don't have to worry that God doesn't love us. He's not willing to forgive us, that he's going to completely reject us every time we fail. It means that our relationship with God, in that relationship, we have a way to reconciliation, to restoration of relationship, to fellowship with him. We don't earn forgiveness through our actions, but in turning away from sin and following God, we demonstrate our heart's desire to love and obey. And maybe some of us here this morning need to hear this. Need to understand this, not just in our heads, but in our hearts as well. In our relationship with God in Christ, in salvation, God doesn't reject you. He doesn't kick you out every time you fail him in sin. He loves you. God loves you. He wants you to love him in return. And in his love, he has made a way for us to come to him, to confess the ways in which we failed, to turn away from the things that are leading us away from him and to return back to him. He eagerly desires that we do this because he loves us and he wants what's best for us. So I'd encourage you this morning, don't, when you fall into sin, don't let your shame Turn you away from him. Use that. Use that shame, that conviction of how you failed to hit the mark. Use that to push you towards him in repentance. Renouncing the sin, turning away, rejecting it. Recommitting to following him in all areas of life. Confessing your shame, your sin seeking to live in the power that he provides in the spirit to serve and follow his will. Repentance is a gift, so don't avoid it. Do it. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we are, as always, so thankful for your word. God, this morning, especially in light of the world in which we live and all the ways that the world tries to teach us falsehood, tries to pull us away from you, tries to tell us that right is wrong and wrong is right. God, we are so thankful for the absolute and foundational authority of your word, of your commands, your, your teachings, your law, showing us beyond all doubt what is right and what is wrong, showing us so many ways that we can honor and serve you with our hearts and with our actions. God, my prayer for each and every one of us this morning is that we would look to your law, look to your word in this light. Not as burdensome, but as the way to life. God, help us to love you and your word. Help us in that love to do these things. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
stand with us. To our elder update, I'm actually very encouraged, very excited about where God is leading us and God has us. So when I was getting ready for this update, I made a list of the ministry opportunities and events that God has given us the past number of months. I realized that there were many, so many, that I could be up here for a while, so I hope you guys don't have any lunch plans. Uh, but uh, so today, to keep it brief, Briefer, I wanted to focus on some opportunities God's given us to minister to our community. This was one of the big things that 
I know I personally was, and our church was excited about reaching out more to our local community. Donna mentioned this in her announcements, but we've been able to have groups from the Highland High School sports teams having their pasta night here. I know the awards night for the attract team. And I know she said everyone loves Randy, but let's be honest, who doesn't love Randy? We've also had a basketball ministry on Monday nights. I know a couple people, Pastor Jeremy, uh, Joel Barnes, I think Gray, Greg Gabo have been heading that up. They've had 12 regulars and sometimes as many as 20 overall who come to play basketball. And there's been so many and just uh, such a great turnout. I know Jeremy has started doing a short devotional with them. And a lot of them are people from our community, people who may not attend our church. So that's just really cool to hear. Also, play dates in the park. There's where we have where the um, moms and kids and the guardians can come and uh, spend some spend some time together. Uh, I know Sarah Van Gorp has been heading that up at the different parks. Uh, there's been 10 to 15 regular attenders and another 10 that come sporadically. And I know there's a really solid group, so that's just really awesome to hear. They'll be transitioning back to toddler gym time as the weather gets cooler. Also, one more thing. A couple months ago, not a couple months, about a month ago, I shared with you guys that we were raising money for our Timothy scholarship to help Pastor Jeremy and send him for his next semester to Moody Bible Institute for his Master's of Divinity degree. We needed $3,000 by, by, uh, God's, pro by God's provision and uh, you guys, your, your guys' gracious giving. His next semester is paid for. Yep. <laughs> yep. Praise God. So that's what's kind of been happening. What's, been, what's coming up or what keeps going? Go groups. We are going to do another push for grow, go groups. We're going to have signups. What they are is we get together in a small group, talk about Adam's message and uh, just ask questions about it and just to, to dissect it. But we also pray for each other, fellowship with each other. Like I told you guys a few months ago, without Go Group, I would have never realized Rick Trisnado and I were cousins. So uh, Go Group is a very, uh, just a very great thing. We have a, a few going right now. Dan Slusser leads Tuesdays online, and that's going to be still going on Tuesdays. So if you would like the Zoom password, please ask him for it. He's d right down here. Uh, mine actually is meeting on Friday nights, but on starting on September 13th, we are actually going to be moving it to Tuesday nights here in person. It's going to be at church. We're going to be meeting in 201. I know Fridays aren't convenient for a lot of people, so I'm hoping that maybe we can get some more people to come if it's on a Tuesday night and do, do the same thing, talk and pray and uh, just study God's word together. I know it's been a real blessing to me and I'm sure it'll, it's been a blessing to your group, Dan, I'm, I'm sure. So please ask one of us, and I know Pastor Jeremy also has one for the college and career age. Is that on Wednesdays, Tuesdays? Tuesdays. So if you are of that age, ask Pastor Jeremy, and he'd love to talk, talk to you about that. Women's Bible study is coming up. As, as Donna said, they are going to be doing uh, The God of the Covenant by Jen Wilkin. And so I know there will be signups for that. And men, you are not uh, left out here. Men's, we have a men's breakfast every month, uh, the first Saturday of every month, except for this sun, except for this month because it is Labor Day. So we are having it on September 10th. So please make sure if you're able to, to come. We start at 7 a.m. and just have some really, really great food. And there is more that's going to be coming down the pipeline, and I'm really excited to, to share that with you guys once uh, I, we have more, more details. I just didn't want to spoil the surprise, so stay tuned. I also wanted to share what the elders are doing. I want to recognize that we have had changes in our church office the, the past few months. There have been some that have um, moved on from the office. We have some positions that have been eliminated for right now. And we've also had the uh, pastors and a couple other staff switch 
offices. So all, if you go in there, all the pastors are on one floor together. If you go to Pastor Jeremy's uh, email, he has a video showing his coffee maker that he's very excited about. And also we've changed the office hours, uh, I believe 9 to 3, 9 to 3.30, Tuesday through through Thursday. I might have misquoted that, Ron. But uh, 4, 3? 4.30. 4.30, thank you. So 9 to 4.30. Thank you. So uh, that's Tuesday through Thursday. Something else the elders have been doing as we meet together, we've been praying more over our church directory. What we do is we've split up uh, your guys' names in our directory, and we pray over you guys. One person takes a one section, the another takes an, uh, another section. So you, I, I want you guys to know that you are prayed for and that you guys are cared about. We've also been visiting uh, some who cannot make it to church service. We've been serving them communion as well, and that's just been going great. I know we're going to keep doing that. For the first time in I don't know how many years, it's been a while, we are going to be having an elder retreat on September 17th, a Saturday. So please be praying for us as we continue to seek and discern God's will and direction for Mission Bible Church as we go forward on that date. I know it's hard to believe that it's uh, at the end of August, but soon uh, will be fall and I know the budget process will be coming up and I would just like to ask for prayer for the deacons, the elders, the ministry leaders as they discern what God would want for the 2023 budget for next year as well as some decisions that will need to be made. And also September 10th is also our board meeting and everyone is invited. It may not be the a board meeting that you, are, you think about or are accustomed to when you hear the term board meeting were a lot of fun but we also do, we also do uh, business and pray together. But uh, we just encourage you to come see what we do and uh, what we talk about, and because it's open for everybody, we'd, we'd love to see that. So to kind of end here, that's kind of all I had as far as updates. I did want to be transparent with you all. If you've ever been on an elder board or deacon board, there are challenges. And the time that I've been on the elder board, the past two to three years, there have been a lot of challenges. It's been tough. I, I know my brothers on the elder board and the pastor, pastors will agree with me. I know that for, for, for me personally, there's been times where I've felt anxiety, discouragement, uh, weariness, uh, wondering what's happening, what's going to go, ne- what's going to go wrong next. But... God um, shared, God pointed me to this verse that I know I've read before and again and again, but I needed it right here. And I wanted to share it with you guys. Hebrews 12, one through three. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And that's what we need to do. As, as, an, elder, as an elder board, we're fixing our eyes on Christ when it, the going gets tough, when it gets um, when we don't know what's going to happen next, but we focus on Christ and that gives us strength because he is our strength. And I just ask for continued prayer for both the deacon and elder boards as we uh, go about it and continue on. So why do I share this? Because I know I'm not the only one here who has tripped on potholes and ran into obstacles in the road that have at- attempted to impede the course of their race. It gets difficult when we look at all the chaos, the destruction, the opposition to God that is continually going on in our world. It can make us wonder, what's going on? Where's God? What's he doing? So that's why we need to fix our eyes on Christ to consider him who endured opposition from sinners. So as we leave here today, I wanna again encourage you with the last verse of this passage I read, not to grow weary, not to lose heart in living for Christ. 
because we're if we are in Christ, we're all running a race. And we are called to live our lives for Christ. It gets hard, it gets tough. But thankfully, if we fix our eyes on Christ, God will give us that, that strength as, as we go through those times of weariness, those times of trial. If you have any questions about any of the updates or any su- su- suggestions, I'll be up here. Uh, the pastors and elders will also be up here. Hope, hopefully, I'm not the only one up here. Um, but uh, if you guys could, could stand, and I will pray and know you have a church family here who loves you and will hold you up and encourage you as we run the race together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, I just thank you so much for my church family. I thank you, Lord, for how they've held me up, and I know we hold each other up, Lord, in, in prayer and in encouragement. And Lord, as we continue to minister, Lord, to our people and our community, and to uh, seek what you have next for us, Lord, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. You are the author. You are the perfecter. You are the example, Lord, of the faith, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you and not falter. And Lord, I ask as we go uh, from this place, Lord, that you would help us to be a good example, a Christ-like example in the world we live in, a world that needs you so much, Lord, and just seems so dark. But Lord, we, we, we take hope, we take comfort, Lord, in, in the fact, Lord, that you have overcome the world, Lord, and this isn't the end, and you are coming back one day, and we pray for that very, very, very soon. But until then, Lord, help us to live lives and honor you and please you, and that your name may be honored and glorified in each of our young lives. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you, church family. You are dismissed. We love you.